All right. So in quick review from where we left laugh, left off last week, we had talked about the Great Depression and its global reaction. We talked about new technology, film, photography, radio, uh, electricity, and how it's still quite expensive. Uh, we talked about new ways of identifying. We discussed new sciences, whether they be social sciences like psychology and sociology or quantum physics, the rise of artists, airplanes, which captivated the world. And we then discussed the movements for Indian independence, Mahatma Gandhi, as well as the partition of Pakistan away from India, which is where this, as you see on this map, as well as the area of Kashmir, which is still disputed. And now we're going to change gears and begin talking about Mexico, Argentina, and Brazil. And our years of focus will be 1917 to 1949. And we'll begin with the Cardenas reforms. The Mexican Revolution that began in 1910 ended a dictatorship in Mexico and established a constitutional republic. A number of groups led by revolutionaries, including Francisco Madero, Pasco Orzoco, Pancho Villa, and Emiliano Zapata, participated in the long and costly conflict. Though a constitution was drafted in 1917 and it formalized many of the reforms sought by rebel groups, periodic violence continued into the 1930s. In February 1913, Francisco Madero, who had led the struggle to overthrow the dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz, was taken prisoner and assassinated on the orders of the rebellious general Victoriano Huerta, who seized control of the government. And Huerta's repressive military dictatorship provoked civil war almost immediately. Vistiano Carranza headed the new revolutionary force. And at age 18... A new man would join the revolutionary forces, and his name was Lazaro Cardenas. And again, he's very young, but he's brilliant. And he leads a, um, a force under General Guillermo Aragon. Within a year, he rises to the rank of captain. When the revolutionary forces split into opposing factions, he remained loyal to Carranza, whose army triumphed in 1920. And in that year, Cardenas was appointed general the highest rank in the Mexican army and continued to participate in military campaigns in 1929. In 1928, President Obregón's successor, Plutarco Elias Calles, founded the National Revolutionary Party that would oust the constitutionalists. Calles' successor, President Lázaro Cárdenas, removed generals from government, redistributed land, made loans available to peasants, replaced church-run schools with government schools, he organized workers and peasant confederations, and he, most importantly, he nationalized the foreign-owned oil companies that had dominated Mexico's petroleum industry. At the end of the 19th century, the introduction of railroad and refrigerator ships transformed Argentina from an exporter of hides and wool to an exporter of meat. The introduction of the Lincoln sheep and Hereford cattle for meat production led Argentinian farmers to fence, plow, and cultivate the pampas, transforming the pampas into farmland like that of the North American Midwest, and they became one of the world's greatest producers of meat and wheat. Argentina's government represented the interests of the oligarchia, a small group of wealthy landowners. This elite had little interest in anything other than farming. They were content to let foreign companies, mainly British, build the railroads, processing plants, and public utilities. Argentina exported agricultural goods and imported almost all of its manufactured goods. Brazil's elite of coffee and co uh, cocoa planters and rubber exporters resembled the Argentinian elite. They used their wealth to support a lavish lifestyle. They allowed the British to build railroads, harbors, and other infrastructure, and imported all of their manufactured goods. Both Argentina and Brazil had small but outspoken middle classes that demanded a share in government and looked to Europe as a model. The disruption of European industry and world trade in World War I weakened the land-owning classes in Argentina and Brazil so that the urban middle class and the wealthy landowners shared power at the expense of the landless peasants and urban workers. During the 1920s, Peace and high prices for agricultural exports allowed both Argentina and Brazil to industrialize, but the introduction of new technologies left them ag again dependent on the advanced industrial countries. 
Aviation and radio communications were introduced to Argentina and Brazil during the 1920s, but European and U.S. companies dominated both sectors. The Depression hit Latin America very hard, and it marks a significant turning point for the region. As the value of their exports plummeted and their economies collapsed, Argentina and Brazil, like many European countries, turned to authoritarian regimes that promised to solve their economic problems. In the 1930s, Brazil closely resembled European fascism when Getulio Vargas came to power. And he would reign from 1930 to 1945 and again from 1951 to 1954. In Brazil, Vargas staged a coup and followed a policy that increased import duties and promoted national firms and state-owned enterprises. In the process, industrialization brought all of the usual environmental consequences, mines, urbanization, slums, the conversion of scrubland to pasture, and deforestation. Vargas instituted reforms that were beneficial to urban workers, but because he did nothing to help the landless peasants, the benefits of the economic recovery were unequally distributed. In 1938, Vargas staged a second coup, abolished the constitution, and made Brazil a fascist state, and thus infected not only Brazil, but all of South America with temptations of political violence. He himself was overthrown in a military coup in 1954. Vargas followed Mussolini's model, organized society into corporations that could be controlled by the state and suppress civil groups. Economically, the Depression hurt Argentina almost eh, almost as badly as it did Brazil. But the political consequences were delayed for years. In 1930, General José Urberio overthrew the popularly elected president and initiated 13 years of rules by generals and the oligarchia. In 1943, Colonel Juan Perón led another coup and established a government that modeled itself on Germany's Nazi regime. As World War II turned against the Nazis, Perón and his very famous wife, Eva, appealed to urban workers to create a new base of support that allowed Perón to win the presidency in 1946 and to establish a populist dictatorship. Perón's government sponsored rapid industrialization and spent lavishly on social welfare programs, depleting capital that Argentina had earned during the war. Perón was unable to create a stable government, and soon after his wife died in 1952, he was overthrown in a military coup. And part of the reason why I have a picture, that little tiny one of Juan Perón and the larger one of Eva, um, Eva was affectionately called Avita, and the people of Argentina really liked her. She worked very hard to earn their trust, to make a connection with them. And a lot of historians argue, and using the fact that after she dies of cancer in 1952 as proof, he was overthrown in a military coup. And a lot of historians believe that she was actually the real voice of power um, through her husband, Juan, given the time. Keep in mind, guys, this is late 40s, early 50s. A woman had not yet been elected as any leader of a major modern day nation. So there's the argument you can make for that. She wouldn't be the first either. Um, Woodrow Wilson, massive stroke. Um, His cabinet did not know about it for weeks because his wife kept him in their private area of the White House, um, took messages to him, came back with an answer. Only weeks later, it's learned Wilson can actually speak because of the stroke. So just throwing that out there. Anyway, moving right along. All right. So we're changing gears again, which is always fun for everybody involved. And we're going to move on to colonial Africa, economic and social changes. And we only have a few slides to go, and then we're going to stop it for today. In Africa and Southeast Asia, during the 1930s, Western educated leaders began to challenge colonial authority. Outside Algeria, Kenya, and South Africa, Few Europeans lived in Africa. However, the very small European presence dominated the African economy and developed Africa as an exporter of raw materials that brought benefit to Europeans, but to very few Africans. 
Africans were forced to work in European-owned mines and plantations under harsh conditions for little or no pay. Colonialism provided little modern health care, and many colonial policies worsened public health, undermined the African family, and gave rise, rise to large cities in which Africans experienced racial discrimination. Colonial authorities had always used indigenous allies to help them administer the colonies. The gap between aspiration and reality was particularly vast in the French colonies. Western educated Africans and Asians particularly resented the fact that colonial administrators relied on indigenous authorities to administer the, co the colony. For the European powers, indirect rule was a way of preventing nationalist movements. This did not always work, an example being the uprisings that would occur in Africa and later on in Southeast Asia. Especially in Africa, the Igbo Women's War in the 1930s, as well as the Nigerian nationalist Nambi Azkikwi, protested this policy as preventing the unification of Nigerians. Anti-colonial feelings were highest where Europeans had settled, and the Great Depression caused widespread economic disruption in Africa and in Southeast Asia. During the colonial period, many Africans turned toward Christianity. Missionaries introduced Christianity, except in Ethiopia, where it was indigenous. Islam spread through the influence and examples of African traders. The contrast between the liberal ideas imparted by Western educators and the realities of racial discrimination under colonial rule contributed to the rise of nationalism. Early nationalist leaders and movements, such as Blaise Daigene in Senegal, the African National Congress in South Africa, and Pan-Africanists like W.E.B. Du Bois and Marcus Garvey from America had little influence until after World War II, when Africans who had served in the Allied War effort came back with new and radical ideas. Radio broadcasts in indigenous languages were largely confined to British West Africa in the interwar years, with most African radio content aimed instead at European colonial populations. Africa had little representation in cinema except for some stereotypical movies and that would also help to start the pan-african movements that will become very prominent especially after world war ii where many africans were drafted to fight the war effort and a lot of that recognition is not given until years down the road all right i'm gonna wrap everything up if you have any questions, let me know, as always. Otherwise, have a wonderful day, guys. Toodles.